Good morning. Happy Sunday. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. Be able to come together, to fellowship with one another, to experience the power and the presence of God. We are blessed. Want to start this morning? Um, we're going to ask Mary um, and Patrick if you guys will come forward. Um, we're going to um, anoint Mary with oil and um, pray for her. She is um, facing surgery this week. I believe it's a hip replacement. Is this the second one? And if anyone else wants to come and lay hands on her with me in agreement, you're welcome to do so. We know that. That the Lord's got you. He's brought you through much. He'll bring you through this too. All right? So we have some partners that are going to join us. Lord, we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do in this body. Lord, we know that as she goes, Father God, there may be nerves, there may be um, anxiety. But, Father, we know that her rest, her heart rests in you. That you, Father God, are her comfort and Lord, that you will calm the nerves. But Lord, that as she faces this, that she's done it before, you will be with her as you were. Lord, that she doesn't have to worry and that as she goes through this, we ask God that the doctors be guided, that they have wisdom, Father God, that you allow them, Lord God, to, to fix the issue, Lord, that she would come out with the he, um, healed in, um, in your name. And we pray, God, that a healing, as she heals over the next couple of weeks, that it's quick, that she would mend every bone and every ligament, all of the, um, the blood vessels, Father God, would come together and that she would be stronger than she was before. Lord, we give you thanks for what you're going to do. Lord, we give you thanks for the healing that comes through the doctor's hands. And we give you thanks, Lord, that, came from the, um, that we get from the healing from the stripes that were placed on your back. We claim the healing, Father God, for her this morning and over the next couple of weeks. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We uh, missed Pastor Ken this morning, but he's having an opportunity uh, to celebrate with one of his uncles, a, a big milestone birthday. And so he's away for the weekend, but he'll be back um, prayerfully tomorrow. And so we pray for safe travels as he and Carla return and uh, Susan's with, with them. So we're grateful that he had another opportunity to get away. But um, we do miss him, and we'll celebrate with him next week in the Lord's house. Amen. So, here we are, another Sunday, in the presence of God and the fellowship with the saints, and we can just take a deep breath, and we can forget about the worries, the life, all of the things that are going on around us outside of here. You know what? The banks are closed today. You don't have to worry about your bills. It's Sunday. They'd be, they'll be there tomorrow anyway. But for now, we're just going to sit back and enjoy the presence of God, and we're going to allow him to speak to our hearts this morning. Amen? So I'm going to start out with a reading in John 6, 1 to 14. So if you will, read or stand with me as I read the word of God. And it starts out with, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat. But this he said to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, but every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, 
Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? And then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in this place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come to the world. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your presence as well. We ask God that as I minister today, that you would remove me from the equation, that I'm the willing mouthpiece this morning, speaking to your people, that they not hear my voice, but they hear the voice of God today. We ask that the word would penetrate their hearts, that they would realize, God, that in everything, today and tomorrow, and for the rest of our lives, God, that you are more than enough. Lord, help us to get this to not be just a cute little Sunday school story, but that this be a truth, Father God, that we can live by day in and day out, that we would look to you in situations of lack, and Lord, that we would not even look in ourselves and our own insufficiencies, that we would always look to you because you really are more than enough. Lord, speak today. Speak to every person here and allow us to leave here with a new knowledge of you. We give you thanks, God, for what you are going to do in this word and in this place. We praise God and we give thanks in the mighty name of Jesus and God's people say it. Amen. You may be seated. So these verses paint a picture. A picture that is filled with impossibilities. Things that are impossible in the eyes of man. But to God, there was no impossibilities in this situation or in any other. But for God, this was just an opportunity. A simple opportunity for him to display his power to those that were there. In a different way than just healing. Because they, it says that they had seen the things that he had done. That they, they had seen the signs which he had performed on those that were diseased. So they had seen him work in that way. But this was a way for him to show off his ability, but his, his awesomeness, his power to those in a different way. It's an awesome opportunity for him to show them his ability to overcome situations that would come at him, but for us to see that he can overcome the situations that come after us. Amen? So I want, to take, I want you to take whatever burden that you may have this morning, whatever personal care, whatever situation, whether it's in your walk with Christ, whether it's in work, or at school, or wherever else, in all the walks of life, I want you to take that burden, and I want you to look at this burden through the eyes of God. I want you to look at it the way Jesus saw this situation. Because he's looking at your situation through his eyes, and he's not seeing the impossibility that you see in your own. And so if we learn to look at things through the lens that Jesus does, we begin to realize that he is more than enough. We can realize that Jesus can handle it, and we don't have to. We get to sit back and just kind of join the ride and allow him to take full control. But evidently, this story is so important, it's so significant, that God wanted it repeated. This is one of the stories that is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. So he wants to make sure that we understand it, that we get it. Jesus knows 
everything. We walk around and live life like that's not true. We got to tell everybody everything that's going on. We broadcast it on Facebook. We, everybody we come into contact, oh, this is what's going on. And, and we, we go about telling everyone, but we forget sometimes that the best source, the best person that we can go to is Jesus. Sometimes it's nice to vent or to, to talk about something that you're going through, but I would challenge you that it not be someone that you go to to talk about the things of life first, that Jesus be the first one you go to. Give it to him, express yourself to him, allow him to know your heart in that intimate way, and then if you're going to if you feel the need to continue to share it, then share it with other people. But we make the mistake of going to people first. When people can't do anything for us, people will lie to us, tell us what we want to hear, tell us we're right when we're really wrong. And that feels good to us, but if we go to God, he's not going to he's not going to pat us on the back and give us a coddle and say, "You know what? You're okay." He's going to speak to our hearts and he's going to correct us where we're wrong and he's going to try to set us right. He's going to be the compass that Chris is talking about that tells us the direction that we're supposed to go, the path that our feet are supposed to stay on. You know what? None of that was part of the message, but now, a little bit extra, I guess. So Jesus knows everything. In Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore you are more value than many sparrows. We do walk about as though God doesn't know what's going on in our life. That he maybe doesn't care about what's going on with us. He does care. He intimately cares. He, he cares so much that he was willing that his son would go and die the death that he died on Calvary so that you and I would be able to walk in victory. And not just so that we could walk in victory here, but that we can live eternally with God the Father and that we would have the ultimate victory over death, hell, and the grave in the same way that Jesus did. So Jesus knows, but Jesus cares. And we think that because he knows our thoughts and he knows our hearts, he knows where we've been and we, he knows what we've done, that somehow we are separated from him and he is far off and can't possibly be that concerned about what we're going through. But there's a scripture that says that nothing will separate us from the love of God. He cares and he loves us and he knows us and, and he loves us in spite of what he knows about us. He knows the situations that we're facing. He knows our thoughts. He knows our worries. He knows your talents. He knows your purpose. He knows his plan for you and he knows the outcome. I wanted to throw in your talents because we know our talents sometimes, and, and he does too, but he also knows when we're not using them to honor him or when we're not using them for his glory. So in the scripture, it tells us, it was talking about the birds, but I love verse 30. He knows the hairs on our head. We don't have to fear. If he cares that much about the, the birds of the air, if he cares that much about the, the land and the sea and the world that he created, how much more does he care about us? Because we are the ones that were created in his image. We, he didn't come and die for the sparrow. He didn't come and die for the mountains and the oceans. He came and he died for you and he came and he died for me. So we read back in John 6, and we take a look at verse 6. It's um, actually go back to verse 5 where it says, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he saw a great multitude coming toward him. And he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these 
may eat. In verse 6, but this he said to test them, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Jesus already knew how he was going to handle the situation before the situation ever even materialized. He asked them, how, where are we going to get something for these guys to eat? How many times do you think that he's going to ask, that he asks us or that he even stays quiet in the middle of a storm to see if we know what the answer is? If we know that we need to, to stop and to rest in him and to rely on him and to wait on his voice and to get into his word and to pray and to communicate with him and to get together with the saints, how, do you, how often maybe he's doing that? He asks us the question and says, Todd, what's the answer? And out of my own flesh, I come up with something. And he's like, no, no, no. Or he says, in the middle of the situation, he just sits back with his arms and says, you've got this, my child. And sometimes we do have it. Because we trust in him, we put our faith in him, we, we allow him to be the compass, we allow him to guide our steps, we allow his word to speak to us. But church, far too often when we, we don't hear him in the middle of the storm, we, we take it upon ourselves and do everything in, our, in the flesh, and we end up messing up. But you know what? He doesn't say, oh, you failed again. He doesn't, he doesn't turn his back on us. He doesn't come and put his finger in our face. He says, come on, my child. He says, we'll, we'll try it again another time. He wraps his arms of love around us, and he takes us into his bosom, and he speaks to us in the quiet place. And he shares with us, and he ministers to us, and draws us closer to him, if we allow him to do that. But in the situation, Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. He knew that he already had an answer, that there was a way to to meet the need of these people. God already has the answer to the problem, the answer to your situation. He has the answer to your question before you even have a question to ask. He has an answer before the situation happens. He has an answer to the problem before you ever see it as one. He's always ahead of the game. More, a few steps ahead of us we're reminded that he knows the circumstance. He, he's on the outside looking in, and we're in the middle of it. And sometimes we can't see what's going on because we're in the middle of the storm. All we have to do is look to the one who controls the storm and find our rest and our solace in him. So God hadn't left anybody down up until this point. He provided a ram for Abraham at the Mount, at Mount Moriah. He provided the ravens and the poor widow to feed Elijah. They had a problem, but there was an answer before they even realized it, and God met their need where they were, and they were able to come out of their circumstances. And, and even Abraham was able to stand beside his son and worship with his son instead of having to sacrifice him. Our response is often, if we move down to verse 7, where Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them might have a little. Our response is oftentimes, I can't. We can't. It'll never work. It's never been like that before. Or some church people who are stuck in religion are like, it's always been done this way. We can't possibly do it another way. But Philip's response in this situation centered around money, eight months' wages, about $12,000 today. There's no way we can, pay or we can feed these people. There's not enough money. We don't have the resources. Andrew's response was similar. It centered around what could not be done. We too often look at the impossible. We look at what's rational, and we look at what's logical. How does it make any sense that Jesus took two and five, and it was more than enough? 
How does it make any sense to us? When we're looking at it in a, with a rational mind and, and trying to use logic, there's no way on earth it makes any type of sense. I thank God for that because my God doesn't make sense. He's too big and he's too powerful to make sense for my mind to understand, for my logical and rational mind to understand. He's bigger and he's better than that. He's more than enough. If I could understand him, if this little puny pea brain could understand him, he couldn't be God. He took the two, and he took the five, and he came up with more than enough. How does that work? The question from Jesus was, how are we going to handle this? Where are we going to get enough to feed these guys? Their response was four different questions. First, let's get rid of the problem. In Mark, it says, Let's turn them away. I hope that that's never our response to the need of the community or the need of the people who come in here and need Christ is to never turn them away. But it is the Lord, show me their need. Lord, show me what their want is. Show me what they need in you. And Lord, help me and help our church meet the need. But Lord, more than any physical need, Lord, help us see, help, let us help them see their need for you. And that they would know to come Christ the way we do. And that they would know that God of salvation. So our response can't be to let's turn them away or get rid of them. It was also in John 6, 7, let's raise money. They didn't have enough. In some instances, the response is let's give up. We have a little... It's never going to be enough. There's no way we can tackle the need. There's no way we can reach all of the people that are beyond these doors. The best response is finally, let Jesus have it. Let's give what we've got to Jesus. In this situation, it was the bread and the fish. Let's give it to Jesus and let him work with it. But for us, let it, let's give him our broken backgrounds. Let's give him our, our futures and our hopes. Let's give him our will. Let's give him what um, our vision is for our church and for our community. Let's give it to him because he will take that. He will break it down into something beautiful. And then he can use it. And then people's lives will be touched and restored because of it. So don't listen to anything the flesh has to say about the situations that you're facing. Because it will lie to you. Your flesh will lie to you about what you're going through. It's impossible. There's no way you can handle this. How are you going to get yourself out of this? Just give up and die. Those are the things that we say to ourselves. Those are the things that the enemy will tell us and lie to us and hope that we do give up and that we lay down and that we give up. But if we realize who it is that we're serving, if we realize it, who it is that was taken to the cross, that was beaten beyond a recognition, who died and was buried but rose again, if we realize that is who I serve, then I don't have to get discouraged and I don't have to, to become so worried and caught up in what I'm going through because if Jesus overcame it, if Jesus was able to do it and his, the same spirit that raised him from the dead is supposed to be in me, then I can do it too. Because my God is more than enough. He's more than enough in the morning and he's more than enough in the afternoon. He's more than enough when I'm going to bed and he's more than enough when I can't sleep. He's more than enough, church. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it tells us that we're to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to, be, to let your requests be, be known to God. 
and the peace of God which pass, surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. There's too many times that this is a beautiful scripture. And it's one that we have on plaques and we place on our walls and we share it on memes on Facebook. But it can't just be a beautiful scripture that's put on the wall and put on Facebook. It's got to be a scripture that we hide in our heart that we might not sin against God. It's got to be one of those that we find to be absolute truth. And that when we do give ourselves to him and that we stop worrying and we give the worry to him and we stop being anxious and we go to him in prayer, that he will he will give us the peace that passes every bit of human understanding. And people will look at you and they will say, how in the world are you standing? Everything that the enemy has thrown at you should have toppled you over. You should be dead. But you know what? The God that I serve, the God that I serve, the God that I serve, he is more than enough. The God that I serve, he raised from the dead. The God that I serve, he, um, he fed the multitudes. The God that I serve, he healed the lepers. The God that I serve, he fed. He, oh, my God, that's who I serve. There's no lock in God, and there's no limitations in my God. My father, my father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. What's that mean to me today? Because I don't need a cow. I just need to know that he has it. And that when I make my request known, he will come, he will speak to my heart, he will comfort me, and that he will make sure that my needs are met according to his will and his purpose. You see, God wasn't looking for excuses from these men or for us. We're full of excuses. And some don't pass the laugh test when we give them. It's kind of like the dog ate my homework, although that's probably happened. But, you know, the teacher just rolls her eyes. And when we come to God with our excuses, he just rolls our eyes. He's like, I've heard that one before. He's not looking for excuses. He's, looking, he's not looking for our self-doubts or our question marks. He's not looking at our ability. He's looking at our faith. And if we take a look at verse 9, it says, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? They were looking at the size of the gift. God is able to use even the little things. The things that we look at and we feel as though they're so insignificant. Think about this. He used a baby's cry to speak to Abraham. A stick to part a Red Sea. A stone and a sling to remove a giant. And a piece of red cloth at Jordan. He used a starving widow to speak to Elijah, and he used manna to speak to two million people. Your ability and your resources may be small, but God is still God, and he can use anything. It says that he took the bread and the fish it wasn't too small for him. Often he will use the resources that we already possess and he will multiply them in marvelous ways. You know why it's amazing? We look at it as impossible. We look at it as though we have a gift that can't possibly be used in the hands of God. But he does take it. He does break it. He blesses it. And then he does something marvelous with it, and we get to stand back and think, oh, you know what? That's so awesome, God. Thank you for doing that. It wasn't me who did it because I couldn't, but you were able to. There's also the sacrifice of the giver. He gave all that he had. Think about this little boy. His mom, his mom packed his lunch. 
He gets stuck in this, middle, this large crowd in the middle of it. Everybody's hungry. And here he is with his little lunch, maybe in a Pokemon lunchbox, who knows? And they come to him and they find that he's got it and they're like, we need that. You think maybe he's like, no you don't, I'm hungry too. But he gave all that he had. This is all that God asks for any one of us, to give him all. Whether it be great, whether it be small, and he will use it for his glory. It's really never about the size of the gift, but it is always about the size of the heart of the giver. And this is where we oftentimes lose the battle. We are limited by what we have to offer. Even Moses was affected by this. He didn't want to do what God had called him to do because he wasn't a good speaker. Gideon used the same thing. There were other people in the Bible when God spoke to them and called them and told them, they were, I, I can't. I'm not equipped. I don't have the ability. We can get stuck there and we can lose the battle. We don't have to be limited by what we have to offer. Jesus was not disturbed by the offering there. He took it. We will never have a problem or a situation. We'll never face something that is greater than God's ability to overcome it. And think about this. He used the doubters. Those that said, turn them away, and there's not enough, and there's no money, there's not enough resources. He used those same people to feed the hungry. He does this to teach us who he, who's actually in control. When it looks impossible, when it looks like there's no way God can work in the middle of a situation, we're supposed to just keep on serving God. And in serving him, he will reveal to us an answer, a solution. He'll re reveal to us his purpose. He will reveal those things to us in his time, if it's according to his will to do so. But think about this. Every need was met. Possibly 20,000 people by some accounts. It mentions 5,000. Many of them, the men had women with them and had children. And so it's estimated to be about 20,000 people fed from the two plus five. Think about what your God is able to do. How he's able to show up and show off. How he's able to say, this is who I am. And you know what? He is awesome, and he's powerful, but he has not changed. The word of God tells us he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he had the ability then to show up and defeat 20,000, he's got the ability to show up today at New Life, and he's got the ability to speak into your life, and he's got the ability to heal what's broken inside of you. He's got the ability to, the power, I should say, to forgive you of sin. He has the power to help you overcome whatever it is in life that has come to pull you down and to cause despair in your heart. That's my God. He took the little one. He turned it into a whole lot. So I want to challenge you to place your little in the Lord's hands today. I want you to Put your little life. To you it may seem little and insignificant, but to him it's so much more. So place that in the hands of God today. Place your little faith in God's hand. You see, it's only a little. All it requires is of a mustard seed. So put it in the hands of God today. Put your family in the hands of God today. Those that are lost, those that are hurting, those that don't need him, put them in his hands today. 
Put your body in the hands of God today. It hurts and it's breaking down and there's so many physical needs. Well, put it in the hands of God today. Put your hopes in God's hands. Put your dreams in God's hands. Put your expectations for what your life should have been or how things might have should have turned out. Put that in God's hands. Thinking about what could have been or what should have been will only bring discouragement to us. But God doesn't want us to become discouraged. He wants us to be uplifted and to have the joy of the Spirit of God. And put your problems in the hands of God. The big problems, the little problems, the problems you think you can handle and the ones you know you can. All the problems, everyone in between, belong in the hands of God. I don't believe in reading this scripture that it never even occurred to Jesus that God wasn't going to come through. That God would not provide for him to feed. In fact, I know that he never, this never crossed his mind because when we look back at 6 and 7 and the verses, it tells us that he knew what the answer was going to be. He already knew how it was going to come, uh, be turn out. But Jesus simply took it and he blessed it. He didn't keep it. He gave it back. And when he broke it and he blessed it, because he didn't keep it and he gave it out, it didn't just help the boy. It didn't just help the person who came with the boy, but it helped every person that, it, that was there that day. We might be holding on to something that we think God can't use in our life. And because we're holding on to it, there's an unknown number of people who aren't being blessed by what God did for us. The challenges that we overcame through Christ, they're not being aware of our testimony. They're not being, we're not showing them the gifts that God has given us. So don't hold back on those things, church. Give it to God and allow him to break it. Allow him to mold it and him to use it so that way he can give it back to the people who need it. And so that their lives can be changed because of what God did in you and for you. And you will be amazed when we take a look at Ephesians 3.20, and Chris already quoted this this morning. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could even ask or think, according to the power that worked in us, God is able. I talked about my puny pea brain earlier. That's exactly what it is. And I'm sorry to tell you, when we compare what we know to God, you have the same thing I do. I love all of you. As smart as we are, it's just this big. We have no ability to comprehend or to think or to imagine what God is able to do in us, for us, around us. Our fleshly minds, even full of the Spirit of God, don't have the ability to comprehend that. But he's able to do it, I promise you, church. He did it for the Israelites in their 40 years of rebellion. He did it in the New Testament. He's done it down through history. I know Pastor Kenny, if he were here, would tell him that God has worked beyond what he could ask or think in his life. He's done it in mine. And if I ask for a testimony, you guys would stand up and say the same thing. And for someone that's here this morning and doesn't understand what I'm talking about, I pray that the Spirit of God would arrest your mind, that we would bring that into captivity, and that God would have an opportunity to speak to your mind, and that he would be able to say that I am the God of enough, but I'm the God of more than enough. Didn't God turn water into wine? Jesus, he provided the man in the desert. He allowed the jar of oil to last eight days. He told Simeon which side of the boat to cast and then he couldn't take all that he caught. He knows the answer. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. And if we could just learn to listen, and if we could just learn to 
put it in him. We just might. No, we won't. We just will see God move in our situation. Second Corinthians 2 9 or 12 9. Second Corinthians 12 9. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It says this in the amplified version. But he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough. Always available regardless of the situation. For my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. I love the way this version writes this out. My, his grace is sufficient. It's enough. His grace was enough to cover us from sin, to rescue us from a destiny that caused a, a, had an end into the road in hell. His grace was sufficient for that, but his grace is not just sufficient. His grace is more than enough. His grace, his loving kindness, his mercy, his love, it's all more than enough. I'm going to ask that the worship team go ahead and come forward as I begin to close. The world has defined who we serve. They'll often say that Jesus was a prophet, that Jesus was a good man. They will say that he didn't even exist. He's a, maybe he did. He's a historical figure. They'll call us crazy. They'll say all kinds of things about us. And you know what? The world is allowed to say what the world wants to say. But what we have to know is, and we have to realize is truth, that Jesus was, that Jesus is, and he is yet to come. That he is our everything. That he is our all in all. That he is a living God who is coming again one day for a church. And if we can stay in him and focus on him and give our lives to him, then we will be part of the church that he comes back for. And we may get tired and waiting, but our tiredness, um, it, fine, we're flesh, but that doesn't mean that he's not coming. He just says, stay a little longer, my children. And as we do endure a little bit longer, his grace is enough. His, his joy is enough. His strength is enough. And we will keep on abiding here while he tarries there. And what a day it'll be when we get to reunite with him in the air and those that go before, have gone on before us. And we will see him in his fullness, in all of his glory. And we'll be able to say, thank you, God, for being more than enough. Thank you for being more than enough to get me through the hell that I just came through. But what I came through has prepared me for the worship that I'll enter into. And now I get to sit at your feet for the rest of eternity, living and loving in his presence. Do you look at the things in your life and say that there is no way? I'll tell you this, church, as long as there is a God who sits on the throne of heaven, there is a way. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, I am the way. He's the way to make things happen. He's the way to heaven. He's the way to joy. He's the way to peace. And he is the way He is the way. And if we realize that he has the answer and that he's the way, our lives will be a whole lot easier to endure. What we have to do is to take what we have in our hands, in our lives, and we have to learn to turn it over to him, to allow him to bless it or to break it and to bless it and for him to handle it. And he will make 
a lot out of our little. So I'm going to ask you, what do you need to bring to him this morning? We're going to enter into a time of worship here in just a moment. What seems impossible for you today? What in your life seems so small or insignificant that if you were to give it to God, he couldn't do anything with it? I want you to realize that. And then I want you to give it to him anyway. And then I want you to stand back and stand by in amazement as God takes it and he breaks it and he does something magnificent with it. Allowing him to show off and allowing him to get the glory for it. And as he does, you can just sit back and smile and realize, look at my God work. Look at him do his thing. And as we do that, we'll be amazed by the number of people that are drawn to him because we've allowed him to work in our lives and to use the little in our lives to make a ton. So my challenge is to bring your little to him this morning. Give it to him. Allow him to, to break it and to bless it and to do with it according to his will and according to his purpose for his glory. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for this morning. We thank you for this word. We thank you for the reminder, Lord, that you are more than enough. That regardless of what we're facing, regardless of where we've come from, that you are more than enough. We thank you, God, for that truth this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the word that will penetrate our hearts. We pray, God, now that it grows in our hearts and that it would manifest itself in our living through our faith, Father God. We pray that even we have opportunities to show other people what you've given us, the little that we gave back and how you were able to work it out to become so much more. God, I thank you for the people that are here this morning. I pray, God, that as um, I've ministered this morning, that they've received this word and that it is settled on good ground. And Lord, I pray now that as we enter into this time of worship, that anyone in this house who doesn't know you would be called by your spirit and would feel as though that they need to call upon your name this morning. For we know that when they do, your word says they shall be saved. And we want to celebrate with them this morning. But Lord, if there's someone here today who feels like they're insignificant or the gift that they've got, something isn't enough in your hands, that Lord, that they would realize it doesn't matter what we've got, that you are more than enough. Help us, God, to, to let, it, let it go, to, to give you control, to give it to you, God, so that you're able to work it out and that you can shine and do your thing with it and that you would be glorified in it because of it. We give you thanks, God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you again, Pastor Todd. It's always a blessing to hear you preach to us, and you have always anoint us. And I think I speak for everybody when I say we're glad that you chose new life for your family, for you, Ashley and Seth. Thank you, Lord. I just want to remind you, October 2nd from 4 to 6 is unlocking your potential. You know, sometimes we do, Brother Todd, we think that our, our little, you know, is, is it enough? But let me tell you, God can take your little and turn it into much. And just watch what God can do with that. And I uh, just want to bless you and just, uh, Lord, just bless your week. It's just good seeing God's house and, and seeing God's people and being with you all here this morning. Thank you again, Brother Todd, for the message. and. Challenge my heart too, brother. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, I just to thank you for your word. I thank you for the message, Lord God. And just, Lord, you are more than enough, Lord. You are all in all, Lord God. You are the great I am, Lord. And you're the God of the breakthrough, God. And we just praise you and thank you for that, God. And, Lord, we just thank you for your presence here that is just amongst your people here this morning, Lord. And, Lord, that we would just see... Lord, just the doors that you would open this week, Lord, and the possibilities, Lord, that you can do, Lord, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, Lord. 
And Lord, we're reminded too that God, in you we live and move and have our being in you. So Lord, I thank you, God, that you're a God that goes before us, a God that walks with us, a God that walks in us, and God that stands behind us, Lord. And we thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray, God, just bless your people now. Lord, just uh, prosper them, Lord, in all that they do, God. And Lord, just um, we thank you, God, for you're such an awesome, mighty, powerful God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.